Good morning. I have a bit of a cold, so please bear with me. Um, join me in the call to worship based on Psalm 74, 12 through 17. But you, O God, are my king from old, and bring salvation upon the earth. 
It was you who split open the sea by your power, and you broke the heads of the monster into the waters. It was you who crushed the heads of the leaven and gave him as food to the creature that is dead. It was you who opened up springs and streams. You dried up the ever-flowing river. The day is yours, and yours also the night. You established the sun and moon. It was you who set all the boundaries of the earth. You made both summer and winter. Come, let us sing praise to the God our Creator. Please bow your heads. Holy God, our Father, you, God alone, created the universe and all that is in it. You have blessed us with everything we need. You have given us the gift of grace we don't deserve. Our hearts are filled with joy. We worship you and sing your praise, remembering your mighty hand, the creation throughout history of the earth. All glory and honor are yours for the gift of grace through our son, your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our opening hymn is Sing Praise to God Who Reigns Above, number six. Please join me in a unison prayer of confession. Creator God, maker of all things, we are ruled by desires you don't fully understand. We long to possess more things, bigger things, more expensive things, but always things. We covet power, we covet honor. Sometimes we even covet people because we want to use them as status symbols <clears throat> Forgive us, Lord, for loving what we have created more than we love you. You use costly things to make ourselves feel valuable, only to end up with even bigger cravings. 
We seek spiritual fulfillment in material ways, refusing to accept that such a quest must fail. We confess our desires to be in control, to our own law. We confess that we want to feel as secure as God's, so that not you or anyone else. Heal us from the spirit killing sin of covetous, that we may dedicate our lives to the care and redemption of all that you have made, not the possession of it. For Jesus' sake, amen. This is the message that we have heard from our Lord and declare to you that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. And if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we can have fellowship with one another, and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ will cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Therefore, I declare to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thank you, Cora. At this time, I'd like to invite any of the children to come down for this morning's children's message.
Well, good morning, boys and girls. How are you today? Good. Yeah, so nice to see you all. Say, today I'm going to talk about, uh, in my message, I'm going to talk about dinosaurs. Do you guys like dinosaurs? you have a favorite dinosaur? Anybody have a favorite dinosaur? No? No favorite? Don't you like, like the Triceratops or the T-Rex or maybe a Brontosaurus or a Stegosaurus? No? Oh, man. What would it have been like to live with dinosaurs? Would that be cool? Would you like to see a real live dinosaur once? That'd be pretty cool, wouldn't it? Yeah? Well, our textbooks, probably you've been taught, maybe some of you in school, say dinosaurs lived like 200 million years ago or more. But um, biblically, uh, we read in Genesis today that on day six, God created, it says, the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. Could it be that those beasts were dinosaurs? I mean, if God created them, they had to come someday. But day six is when that happened. But do you know what else happened on day six? Man was created. God created Adam and Eve. That means dinosaurs and humans were alive at the same time? How could that be? Well, you know what? If we read in, in uh, Job, which is one of our readings for today, Job chapter 40, and uh, listen to this description. Job is talking to, or actually God is talking to Job. He says, look at the behemoth, which I made along with you, which feeds on grass like an ox. He says, what strength he has in his loins, what power in the muscles of his belly. His tail sways like a cedar. The sinews of his thigh are close-knit, and his bones are like tubes of bronze, and his limbs like rods of iron. Now, what does that sound like that's describing? I think, yeah, a dinosaur. Hey, do you know what? I'm going to tell this in the message, but do you know in my NIV Bible, it says it's maybe either an elephant or a hippopotamus? Do you know how a hippopotamus tail sways? Go ahead and put the image up. <laughs> His does that look like a, a, a tail that's swaying like a cedar? It uses it to splatter its, its poop. My. That's not, that's not, a, that's not a, a swaying in the wind like a cedar, is it? Well, I have uh, with me, if you guys ever want to learn more about dinosaurs, um, this is, I have two books, and there are a lot of pictures in here, and they're great to look at. One is called A Guide to Dinosaurs, and the other one is called Dinosaurs of God's Marvel. And uh, they all have pictures. Some of them, this one even describes the different kinds of dinosaurs, uh, like the Allosaurus, it's called the land shark, and uh, all kinds of dinosaurs in there. So you guys are welcome to, to check those out of my office anytime, okay? So let's pray, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you that, uh, Lord, you created uh, dinosaurs, and uh, Lord, that they lived among us. And uh, Lord, help us to see just how important that is to us. And that, uh, Lord, help us to um, understand your word and to, uh, to accept it as truth. Lord, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I said one, two, three. Oh, you know what? I have uh, 12 dinosaurs in here. And I'm going to give you each two, okay? All right, I'm just going to reach in the bag and pull out two. And if you have two of the same kind, let me know. Those are two different ones. Those are two different ones. And you have to remember what kind they are. Oops. There you go. <laughs> All right, here's two more. All right. Thank you. Thank you. 
And at this time, we'll have a minute for mission. Morning. To begin with, uh, I was very surprised uh, this summer. Mission to Nurture does a lot of missions. I always thought Meals on Wheels was probably the most important one due to the fact we're serving our seniors, those individuals also that have uh, slight handicaps so they can remain at home. This summer, Mission to Nurture did the uh, summer lunch program for children. What a rude awakening I had. There's a need for that too, I found out. Dean, he took the lead of the uh, mission with a lot of support from volunteers within this church and throughout the entire community, came up and established a super program for the entire community. Great job, and I'm sure that's gonna be a pro uh, program we're gonna continue looking at. But Meals on Wheels, that's one of the programs I really love. It's, it helps the uh, enable seniors and those physically limited, lim those with limitations to live at their home have a healthy, independent uh, lifestyle. We go out, deliver a meal for them, healthy with them, a healthy meal for them. We visit with them, and it's a safety check. We might be the only people they talk to during that whole day, the person that brings the meal. It's a great thing. Meals on Wheels in the uh, town of Sibley, we have two routes we go through. Once you do, uh, we begin sign up today in the fellowship hall at your leisure, look at your calendar, pick a date, pick as many dates as you want. But it's a fun adventure. You arrive down at the uh, senior center at 11 o'clock. I enjoy going there early. I like visiting with the uh, staff down there, great bunch of folks. Then I like making my round. I go out there in their fellowship hall, talk to them out there, and then I go into the pool room. They got a pool table back there. There's normally three gentlemen back there, sometimes four. They all think they're Minnesota fats. And it's fun joking with them, you know. And then you come out, you get your briefing from the staff, and it's very thorough, very simple. Like I say, they use the KISS principle. I got it figured out. It's super. They tell, eat, tell you the route you're going, who you're going to see, and the meal that uh, they get. You're done in 30 minutes. You can't go wrong. 30 minutes of fun. That's how I look at it. But if you're available, Starting on uh, September 9th through the 20th, take a day. If you've never done it before, come out and ride with one of us. Uh, me and Helene will be doing it this summer too. Head, if you want somebody to ride with, come with us. The only warning is our radio station is country and oldies. And Helene does the driving. I do the walking. But you're more than welcome to come along. But it's a great staff down at the Senior Center. You can't go wrong. And there's nothing wrong with country and oldies. <clears throat> I'm finding out the music I listened to in the 80s is now the golden oldies. So, um, Our first scripture reading from Genesis 1, 24 and 25, and 6, 5 through 8, is from the New American Standard. Then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle, creeping things, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and God and cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps in the ground after its kind, and God saw it was good. Genesis 6, 5 through 8. And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great on the earth, and in every intent of the thoughts of his heart were only evil continually. The Lord was sorry that he made man on earth and was grieved in his heart. The Lord said, I will blot out man whom I created from the face of the land, from man to animals, to creeping things, and to birds of the sky, for I am sorry that I made, that I made them. But Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Our second scripture reading is from Job 40, 6 through 7, and 15 through 18. Then the Lord spoke to Job out of the storm. Brace yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Would you discredit my justice? Would you condemn me to justify yourself? Look at the behemoth, which I made along, the, along with you, which feeds on grass like an ox, 
with strength, with strength he has in his loins, and the power of his muscles of his belly. His tail sways like a cedar, and the sinews of his thighs are close-knit. His bones are tubes of bronze, and his limbs like rods of iron. Our hymn of preparation is, All Creatures of God Are King, number 64. Please remain standing for our gospel reading. Reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 17, verses 13 through 19. This is part of Jesus' prayer for his disciples as they are gathered for the Last Supper on Monday, Thursday. Hear now the reading of the Lord's Word. 
I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. And they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. So sanctify them by the truth. Your word, your word is truth. And as you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. The word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Let us pray. O Lord, may the words of my mouth, the meditations of our hearts, and the actions of our lives be accepted, O Lord, as you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Dinosaurs have, it seems, been uh, one of the most interesting uh, animals or creatures that have been on the face of the earth. Now, one of the first to recognize that dinosaurs were a distinct group of reptiles was by Sir Richard Owen in 1841. And in 1879, two rival scientists from the United States, Cope and Marsh, searched the American West to find fossil bones. This started what became known as the Great Dinosaur Rush or Bones Wars, as they ended up, uh, as they, and that ended in the early 1900s. In their race to find these dinosaur bones, some bone fragments were lost, and forensic evidence of the sites were damaged. Probably one of the most prolific dinosaur hunters was Barnum Brown, who found his first Triceratops skull at a Wyoming dig in 1895, and then in 1902, found his first specimen of a Tyrannosaurus rex that looks like one of these. Now, seeing the dinosaur bones of a Triceratops or a T-Rex, uh, this one happens to be Sue, gives us all, whether young or old, a sense of awe and wonder. And it sparks our imagination of what it would be like to be with dinosaurs. And movies like Jurassic Park have continued to spark our interest. I think we have a little clip to show you from that. We must go faster. <laughs> If you saw that original Jurassic Park, that's probably one of the scenes that uh, you remember most, that uh, T-Rex chasing them down the road. Now, secular scientists tell us that dinosaurs existed 150 to 200 million years ago, and, and that's what's in our textbooks in school right now. And they believe they were brought to extinction, extinction by an asteroid. Now, creation scientists, like the ones from the Institute of Creation Research, have found evidence that dinosaurs existed at the same time as humans. Now, they've also been looking at what happens in Scripture. So what does the Bible say? Well, we read this morning from Genesis 1, 24 through 25. And we looked at the New American Standard Version because it used the word beasts. Now, this version uh, create that says that God created the beasts of the earth. We're not the beasts, dinosaurs. If we take a close look at the numerous species, there's about 30 of them on this slide here. One has to marvel at their design. I mean, they're a small, they're smaller than a dog, a small dog. 
but they're they're huge, like a, a brontosaurus that, that goes um, 60 feet up into the air and weighs some 50 to 75 tons. I mean, there's just no way these beasts evolved over millions of years. And then they also believe that they started out like an alligator-like species of a, of a reptile that crawled that eventually transformed into something that could walk on the earth like this. I mean, how does an alligator turn into the 50-ton seropod like this brontosaurus or brachiosaurus? That's 85 feet long. You can keep it back on the other slide for just a second. Now, this giant can walk on its four feet and hold up its long uh, neck and head. And paleontologists struggle to find out how there could be blood to flow from the heart to pump all the way up into that head. They, they can't explain it, but it's not too difficult for God. It's truly a miracle to also see how, because they're reptiles, they all have eggs, that out of that goop that's in an egg, that out can come a dinosaur of many different shapes, 50, 60 different kinds, and, and turn into something like a, a bronch, brachiosaurus. I mean, only God could do that. The Bible also tells us in Genesis 1.30 that the beasts of the earth started out as herbivores, and that's the next slide. That meant they are plant eaters. They ate grass. They ate the plants of the earth. And it tells us in that text that God gave them every green plant for food. But it was only after the fall of man that the dinosaurs became meat eaters as well. Why is that so? Because that is when sin first entered the world. There was no death on the earth prior to Adam's first sin. All God's creatures lived in harmony with one another. The Garden of Eden was a perfect place. Everything got along. Everything was nurtured. It was a place uh, like no other. But then after the fall, death came to be. Now, according to the Bible in Genesis 6, which is some 1,600 years or so, after that fall, the earth and mankind became increasingly evil. They say the wickedness on the earth was so great and so corrupt and so full of violence that God grieved. He grieved that he had even made man. And God decided then that he was going to bring forth this great flood to destroy all life under heavens and every creature that had the breath of life in it. Now, God chose Noah and his family to make it possible for humanity to survive and, and told him to go ahead and build an ark. Now, you guys know how big an ark is? An ark is longer than a football field, wider than a football field. It's three stories high. It has enough room in it to hold 125,000 sheep-sized animals. And even though most of the animals that probably went into the ark were younger animals, it could hold much more than that. But then that left room for feed and places for uh, animals and, and people to be at. Now, the dinosaurs came from eggs, right? But those dinosaur eggs were, most of them were no bigger than a football. Some they found that were bigger. But those young animals would not have been that large. It could be that there were young dinosaurs on that ark as well. Now, if this is true, then some dinosaurs survived the great flood. Now, the scripture confirmed this. Well, we're told in Job, and it's one of the oldest books written in the Bible, in a conversation between God and Job, God, out of a storm, reminds Job that he is the God of creation. And so in Genesis 40, 15, God said, Look at the behemoth, which I made along with you, and which feeds on grass like an ox. What strength he has in his loins, what power in the muscles of his belly. His tail sways like a cedar, and the sinews of his thighs are close-knit. His bones are like rods of iron. Now, as I said in the, in the children's message, my NIV study Bible says this behemoth is either an elephant or a hippopotamus. And this slide says, those tails don't sway like a cedar tree. 
And we saw the slide of the hippopotamus, certainly not that. <laughs> but it does look like a tail of a brontosaurus. Therefore, it sounds like a description of a dinosaur, like that of a brontosaurus. And there's a, a slide of, the, of a skeletal of what a brontosaurus might look like. The strength, it says in the scriptures, is in its loins or its thighs. It has an enormous hip bone. See, one of the largest bones on that animal is its hip bone. And that's able to carry 50 tons of weight. A tail that sways like a cedar. He has a tail big enough that will sway like a, sweet, a cedar tree. And furthermore, a brontosaurus has leg bones that were massive. The bones on that are, are, are as big as humans, as tall as humans. They are thick. They are strong. They're like a metal beam. Is that not a description of a dinosaur? Now, further evidence that dinosaurs coexisted with humans can be found in the artwork around the world. Now, this is interesting. In the caves of southwestern United States and in the Natural Bridges National Monument in Utah, a Native American drawings are found that look like what? Look like a dinosaur, one of these seropods or bronchiosauruses with a, a long neck and a long tail. In China, a cast of a Montanoceratop uh, is found. And in Cambodia, in a carving that they date back to the 1100s, depicts a stegosaurus. See that in the middle with the spikes on its back? Now, this was discovered nearly 800 years before scientists even discovered the bones of this animal. How could people draw something? They could not see and get it so, so correct. Is this not hard evidence to refute secular scientists who think that dinosaurs lived millions of years ago and never coexisted with humans? And also, does it not confirm that the Bible's word is true? Moreover, secular scientists, one of the difficulties with dinosaurs is trying to figure out how did they cease to exist? What caused them to all of a sudden just stop existing? Their best guess is an asteroid destroyed them and it disrupted the Earth's habitat some 150 million years ago or so. And in regards to that, did you know that the timeline for depicting where dinosaurs fall is based on circular reasoning? So what's that? Well, it means that when you look at rock layers, and this is uh, a scene from the Grand Staircase National Monument in Utah, you can, you can see the different layers of rock. And they look at those different layers of rock, and if they find a dinosaur in one of those lower la layers, then they, and it's a fossil, they, they date it based on how old they think that fossil is. If they find one a little higher up, it's a, a different dinosaur, they, they date that. And, and, that's, and it's all based on an assumed age of that fossil. They don't know. That's circular reasoning. Now that works until they found a fossil that is from an earlier time frame, say uh, thousands of years ago, or even hundred, or thousands of years ago, that are found with a reptile like a dinosaur mixed in. And that actually happened in, in a number of cases. They found fossils of like a T-Rex. Actually, the T-Rex Sioux was found with earlier uh, fossils that came from a much earlier time. They can't explain how that happened. Well, the Bible has an explanation for that. You know what it is? It's called the flood. The different colors of rock layers could have easily been caused by the flood as uh, the waters rose. And the reason there were no large dinosaurs in those lower rock layers is because those larger animals were able to scramble to higher ground. And, and one dig in western Montana actually supports this as over 10,000 adult mayasauruses were found on higher ground. 10,000 of them. Why are they in just one place? 
the flood, the rising flood waters forced him to that area. Now, many of the fossils also show when they dig them up, a catastrophic death. An Allosaurus was found with its head separated from its body. Sue, who is the famous T-Rex, was found with her pelvis resting on top of her snout. How does that happen? Fossils of dinosaurs have also been found at the bottom of lakes, and secular scientists have no explanation for this. But the catastrophic event of a great flood would have caused them to be covered up <clears throat> with water and mud. <clears throat> Secular scientists can also not explain how dinosaur fossils have been washed out into the ocean. Offshore drilling in the North Sea in Norway has brought up some bone frag fragments from marine reptiles, but also from a land dweller a dinosaur, a Platyosaurus, some 70 miles off of the shore, buried in sediment and slurry, and it was more than a mile and a half deep. How did that land animal get out to the sea? Well, something washed them out. Could it have been a flood? A flood-like wave as God sent water on the earth. Genesis 7:11 tells us, in the 600th year of Noah's life, on the 17th day of the second month, on that day, all the springs of the great deep burst forth. And the floodgates of heavens were open, and rain fell on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, it had never rained before that happened. And so the rainwater coming from, down from heaven probably is not enough to cover the whole uh, earth, but the floodwaters from beneath and the deep as well, could have easily covered the earth. How catastrophic was this event? Well, Genesis 7.22 tells us that every living thing that moved on earth perished. Birds, livestock, wild animals, all the creatures that swarm over the earth, and all of mankind were wiped out. Now, the best explanation of why the mix of land and marine organisms together is that there was a massive global flood that covered all the continents, just as it describes in Genesis. Now, the more science advances, they're able to do more testing, look at DNA, look at soft tissue, test bone marrow of fossils uh, to determine their age level. Now, evidence of blood, blood vessels and soft tissue were removed from a T-Rex thought to have been in existence some 200 mil, million years ago. We see the soft tissue could not exist that long. Uh, this slide shows that uh, they know that from looking at Egyptian mummy research, saying that, that uh, those kind of data, those kinds of tissue could only last some 10,000 years, not, not 200 million years. And the recent findings of soft tissue confirm that they are not millions of years old, only thousands, like Genesis tells us. The truth is about dinosaurs is that they did not exist millions of years ago, as some believe, but thousands. We also look at the Old Testament, we have looked at the Old Testament scripture and on the existence of dinosaurs, we found it in numerous places. We are reading from Psalms, also talks about uh, the beginning of creation and the Leviathan. In John, uh, Gospel of John, remember how it begins. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In John 17, 13 through 19, which we read today, Jesus is praying for his disciples, and he's also lifting up the Word of God. He says, Jesus is saying how his disciples have been given the word, but the world has hated them for it. And he prays to God. He says, sanctify them by the truth, for your word is truth. And Jesus is also confirming that God's word is truth, and, and not just part of it, but all of it. Because in Matthew 24, 37 through 39, Jesus confirms what happened in Genesis Jesus says, but as the days of Noah were, 
so shall be the coming of the Son of Man. For as the days that were before the flood, the people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage. And until that day that Noah entered the ark, and they knew not anything of the flood until it came and took them all away. And Jesus said, so also shall be the coming of the Son of Man, that we do not know when that will come. You see, God judged the world once, about 4,500 years ago with a flood. He said he would never destroy the world by a flood again. And Jesus speaks of this Old Testament text as historical fact. The evidence is found in the rocks and the fossils all over the world. The truth is, dinosaurs were created by God, and they lived among us at the beginning of creation. You see, either God's word is truth, or it is not. There is no in-between. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the book of Genesis, of your holy word, which tells us of the origin of everything and informs us of your divine purpose in history the salvation of man, and the restoration of your beautiful creation. O oh Lord, we thank you for the warming of the sunshine and the cooling of the light of the moon and the fresh rain. We praise you who threw stars into space and on the fourth day of creation and set them on their various courses to be signs and seasons and days and years. We are awed by your creative and intricate design and detail, especially when it comes to the creation of dinosaurs on day six the beasts of the earth. We give thanks that your plans are perfect and that you proposed in your heart to redeem man, fallen mankind, and to renew the cursed earth. We thank you for the different seasons and years, and we praise you for the various prophetic signs that have been recorded in Scripture for our learning and preparing. Teach us your ways and draw us closer to you with every passing day, year, season, and tick of the clock. Help us to interpret the signs of times, knowing that Jesus is coming again to be with us and to restore this earth. O oh God, you are the great physician, and we know it's well within your power to bring health and healing to all those who need it. We pray that you would use our medicine, our doctors, nurses, therapists, and each of us to bring comfort to the people who, whose lives are affected by illness or medical concerns. And where it is your will, O Lord, restore those who are sick to wholeness and healing. And so we lift up on our prayer chain of concerns. We pray for Clint Ryder and his family uh, as uh, they're still looking at when a, a new court date will be set. We pray for Jim Travail, who has uh, been having difficulty following a back surgery almost a year ago and just is continuing to have pain. We pray for recovery for him as he meets with a, a specialist this week. We pray for Ruth Kroll as she's dealing with beer breathing difficulties and Lorraine Newman who's dealing with two types of cancer. We pray for Joe Gala who's in the hospital recovering from an infection and loss of his toes on his right foot. We give thanks for Bob Voss's uh, good news and uh, the, after he met with the doctors that he does not have to have any more treatment and they will continue to check him out but we give praise for, for healing. We pray for Dwayne Lawrence as he, he continues to recover and is on oxygen. We pray for Mackenzie Ryder. We uh, pray for a, a more positive outlook for her as uh, she looks ahead uh, in meeting with uh, doctors in Rochester. We pray for Marge DeBerg as she battles her non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, for Violet Byers as she battles her cancer, and for Ruth Jurens as she battles her cancer as well. And for Eliza Jansma, who is dealing with his tumor that's behind his eye, we pray for healing and recovery. Oh Lord, we pray for the families that have lost loved ones re recently, especially for Cindy Grease and family for the death of her father, Ronald Henke. We also want to lift up Pam Travail and her family, whose, whose dad, Al Turek, uh, died this last week and, and funeral was just the other day. We also pray for the family of Kelvin Luthold, who died August 12th, and who is a great uh, grandnephew of Mary Wagner and Donna Houtsma. We pray for, for your hand to be with all those who have lost loved ones. Comfort them, Lord, as only you can. And Lord, we pray that you would be with our nation. Help us to unite 
and to heal our land of divisiveness. Uh, Lord, there's so much turmoil across this land. We, we pray for healing. We pray for peace. We pray for peace not only here, but around the world as well. And Lord, we pray all these things uh, and lift them up into your hands, knowing that you are the one who has all authority, who has the power and grace and mercy to do your will and to be able to turn our unbelief into trust. O oh Lord, let us pray now that prayer you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and deliver us from evil. That's, it's not into temptation, and deliver us from evil. Ryan is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We will now continue our worship with the givings of our tithes and our offerings. Our scripture today is from 2 Corinthians 9, verse 7. Each one must do as he has made up his mind, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Let us pray. Almighty God, you are the giver of every good and perfect gift. Help us to rightly surrender to you all that we have and all that we are, that we may not just praise you with our lips, <clears throat> but with our whole lives, turning our gifts of thanks, our lives, the sorrows, and the joys of all of our days into a living sacrifice unto you. Amen. And our closing hymn is number 271, Standing on the Promises, and the words will also be on the screen.
sing.